Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you will never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcasts on jimmyhinton.org or findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. All right, welcome to this week's podcast here with Jimmy Hinton and... And Jimmy's mom, Clara. All right, this week we are going to hit something that is just hot on the... Uh, on, on the email and phone calls and everything else, that's just something that um, we have received a barrage of messages from parents in congregations who are just desperate for help because they know that there are sex offenders in their church. Uh, these are registered sex offenders, and their church leaders have intentionally chosen to remain silent and to not inform the churches. So the title of this we thought was appropriate. It's called Leaders Give Parents a Fighting Chance. Now, Jimmy, before we go on, maybe you should explain that this is separate from the Catholic Church. We're not talking about the Catholic Correct. Church now. So Correct. Right. So, are. of course, the Catholic Church is very much in the worldwide spotlight, uh, as they should be. And... As bad as it is what the Catholic Church did, and Mom and I were just talking about this, as bad as it is for what they did, where they knew that they had priests who were who were abusing kids, um, what we're doing is a lot worse. Because here we're talking about, and specifically for this podcast, and this is part one, we're going to do two right. parts to this. Next week we'll, we'll do part two. We're specifically talking about people who have, they've been indicted they they have uh, they've either found evidence or they have pled guilty to charges against sex sex abuse against minors. So these are people who we know are guilty. They are one and they spent time in prison. Guilty. They've been uh, convicted, charged, and convicted. So it's a lot different than thinking. They or hear, just wrong. hearing or allegations hearsay. from kids yes, in the church right. or whatever We're it is. We're talking about the real deer deal here. These are people with with actual convictions they spent time in prison and the churches are still not informing parents in the congregation that you have a known registered serial uh felony child rapist in your church and i've adopted that term by the way because i got tired of um church leaders who refer to these people as brothers and as people who have quote unquote and this is a direct quote they have past sins. We're not talking about people who have who have past sins, who have gambling problems, or who who've cussed, or whatever it is. We're talking about felony serial child rapists. These are people who repeatedly rape multiple victims. They have uh, they've been convicted of felonies. They've spent time in prison. And now they're waltzing into your churches with the full protection of your leaders. That's what we're talking about. It's both frightening and sickening. It is. And it it and really it's, is. Genuinely. And it's infuriating. Right. It, it truly is. It, uh, it just leaves us questioning our church leaders. So yeah. let's get into the meat of this. And, and I know it's hard for some people to believe probably that this is going on to this degree right now when all of the, the, the Catholic church is in the headlines every day when we hear more and more about what has gone on with that whole uh, scenario. But this is current. This is daily. Uh, Jimmy and I share emails every single day that are coming in about this very thing happening right now under our noses. And it's, it, 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 I can't keep up with the volume of emails. So uh, that's for those of you who have gotten a response from me. Um, I, I try very hard to, res to respond to everybody. Um, I have emails stacked up that, right. that I've just, I've well, not been able to get to. Sure. And it, it's absolutely an epidemic. 
So here are a couple questions that I have. Um, first, first and foremost, and I think this is something we need to hit on pretty hard. Why is it that church leaders have complete control over the decision of whether to inform the church of known predators? Um, and, and, and the second part of that question is, is this a biblical approach? Is it okay for church leaders who know that they have a, a um, serial felony child rapist in their church, is it okay, is it acceptable for them to hold the monopoly over on whether the whole church is informed or not? Um, and if so, where's the biblical precedent for that? And so I want to argue, first of all, that no, it shouldn't be up to the church leaders. And we've argued this in a past podcast. Um, I think that when it comes to these sex offenders that are in the churches, those decisions ought to be made by survivors who are in the church. So what do we do with it? How do we respond as a church? How do we respond as a community? How do we hold them accountable while still protecting our kids? Those decisions ought to be made by people who've lived it. And Jimmy, I'm hearing what you're saying. You and I have discussed this at length numerous times, but it always circles back to the same thing. Churches, for whatever reason, and we'll talk about some of these reasons, the leadership more often than not chooses to avoid the topic, to hide it under the rug, to protect the abuser Mm -hmm. rather than expose the abuser. And I think we need to address that, not is it right to do, we we know it's not right. We know that Mm -hmm. we know these church leaders should not have this kind of authority or power, whatever Mm -hmm. you want to talk, whatever word you choose, Yet they do. Mm-hmm. And by our submission or our um, allowing it, I'll say, to go on for years and years and years and years and years, it's only escalated and heightened the problem that we have right now. Yeah, we, you know, we had a, a saying in our congregation. <laughs> um, actually, somebody told me this. And he said, um, you know, whether it's our church or whatever church, the elders of the church or whoever it is, whoever's in leadership, they only have as much power as we, the congregation give them. Right. And so when you have these oppressive, whether it's oppressive leaders or whether it's people who hold all the power and they're the quote unquote decision makers of the church, Mm -hmm. they only have as much power as we give them. And sadly, too often we as members of a congregation feel that it's our duty to be in submission to our leaders to the point of just obeying them, Mm -hmm. which is is frightening. Well, and I think that goes back to, uh, you know, to another command um, for children to obey your parents. Okay, so yes, that's absolutely a commandment in the scripture. But there are also a whole host of scriptures that talk about oppressive parents. Right. And and how Absolutely. the community is supposed to shun those oppre- mm-hmm. oppressive right. parents. So it's not, you know, this this submission no matter what. And 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 I don't even like the word submit because that's really a mistranslation of, of, of several words. Uh, a, a much better translation um, is to yield to other people. I like that a lot better. It, it, yeah. Um, this, this word submission... Uh, sometimes a lot gets lost in translation. Mm-hmm. And there are all kinds of passages in, in the New Testament um, that reference church leaders. And the words that are used are, are, are a yielding to in the original language, but we've translated them. Our translators have translated them into English as submission. So submit to your leaders. Well, maybe it's, when maybe th- submission is not really the intended. Right. The uh, intended word, word yeah. or, or or meaning, right? So I think we need to we need to really rethink this and understand that biblically, we have a responsibility to yield to each other. And I would also offer and submit that um, as a minister, as somebody who who teaches and studies the Bible, um, this is a willing submission or yielding to. This is not. 
because they have power and authority that you, that you right. yield to them. This is a willing submission. And so uh, the same individual from my congregation who talked to me about your leaders only have as much power as you give them. He talked about the, the Jewish view um, or culture of elders dating back thousands of years. And anybody who studies um, Judaism or is a Jew themselves understands that the, that the elders would stand at the city gate, right? So they had mm -hmm. the cities had walls around them, and they had a gate that was that was your way in and out of the city. The elders would come and they would sit at the gate, and people who and this is really important, people who wanted to share with the elders would come and talk to them. Okay. They didn't yeah. force people to right. talk to them at the gate. They didn't say, you know what? I, you know, I'm you an elder to, of yeah, this city right. and mm -hmm. you need to come talk to me. And I'm the decision maker of the city. The elders weren't the decision makers of the city. They were people who they were trusted and respected because of their age, their level of maturity and their wisdom. And people willingly yielded to them and would share problems or, or or would ask questions on their way in and out of the city. And here's the important thing. The elders didn't seek them out. The people sought the elders out. They knew that if, if they went down to the city gate, the elders would be parked would there. The they would be sitting there. Yeah, right. And they knew that if they had a question or had an issue, they could willingly approach the elders. They could initiate that conversation and the elders would listen and they would respond. And, and they were, that's, the biblical view of eldership. I think we've lost so much of that throughout the years. And we use the phrase often, you know, he's a man of cloth or he he's wears the robe. And when you hear that, it's almost like we internally think we need to bow down to someone. And I, and I don't mean a, a physical bowing down, but to, you know, back he, down. Yeah. yeah. Where you yeah, back, back down. down and that what that person says is law. What that mm -hmm. person tells us to do, we must do. We do not question, you know, and we've been fed this for years and years and years. And that's, we're now at that point where we almost feel wrong. Uh, if we question mm -hmm. an elder or a church leader or if we step above or outside of the realm of what they tell us or you know, tell us to do. Mm -hmm. And when we we bring this back to this topic of um, is it their decision whether to inform the church of a known predator, and I like the term you're using that are these... Yeah, the serial felony child yes, rapist. Rapist. Um, we've just allowed them to make those decisions for us. And that time has, uh, it's coming to an end. Yeah. I don't think they have that right to keep that information from us. And it's time that we as parents and uh, informed and responsible parents need to wake up and realize, you know, no, they don't have that right. Right. And we need to voice our, our opinion about that. Yeah. Well, I love the model in, in Acts chapter 15, because that's the, the council in Jerusalem, and you had these um, Judaizers who were going around, and you know they were basically just telling people that it, unless you're circumcised, you're going to hell, and you know, you're not really a Christian. And so they were you know giving people a really hard time, and it created quite the stir throughout all the churches. And so um, they called a special council in, in Jerusalem to try to figure out what do we do with this? How do we respond to this? And I love that account because, you know, you have several people, several leaders from the church in Antioch, um, Antioch of Syria. They came down to, to Jerusalem and you almost miss this if, if you're looking through a certain lens, because we just assume this is all just this council of church leaders and, and the lay church members you know, they're waiting on the edge of their seat yeah. for the response from the leaders. That's not at all the picture mm -hmm. that's painted in the book of Acts. So in Acts 15, you have um, several lay church members who came down from Antioch with the other with the other leaders to meet with the elders in Jerusalem. And so you have this 
this, coming together. Yeah, of, it's, yeah. it's this networking mm-hmm. of people where everybody's voice mattered. And it wasn't just leaders shutting out the lay church members and saying, well, we'll take care of this and we'll figure out what to do with these people. Um, it, they really valued the input from their lay church members. And I think that's really important. I think it's a really important it's super biblical important model. important because we've, uh, especially, it gets even worse, I think, in large, these very large congregations of people where members have entrusted the important decisions to the handful of leaders. Yeah. For good or for bad. And as the flock, they follow the leaders. Mm-hmm. And it's just how it is without questioning. And now we're faced with some some serious, serious business here. Yeah. And I, like, I want to make with, it clear, too. I'm, I'm not saying that there should be total anarchy and that the leaders have no, you know, no responsibility whatsoever. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that we've got to get, get away from this really unhealthy model where when it comes to really important matters and when it comes to um, giving parents a fighting chance to protect their own kids, mm-hmm. I don't think the leaders should have a, a complete monopoly on on whether to inform the church or not. And, you know, to, to intentionally hide that information from your congregation, I think ought to be criminal. And you and I well, talked about legislation. Right. Yes. I That we think there ought to be legislation that's passed that if you have from a tier two sex yes. offender on up in your congregation who's exposed to all these children, the, the, the churches ought to be required to notify parents of minor children in the church and say, here's, Here's what the, 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 this person's record is. We're just informing you. Right. Um, and if there's they're on no the Megan's. There's no judging. There's no, no anything. If they're this on the, is, if they're on the sex offender registry, right. you're required to print that off and, and right. send that out to every parent who has a minor child in that congregation. The reason Jimmy and I take this stand so adamantly is it's still going on. These predators, violators of the law, criminals, child rapists are coming into churches. They are warming up to people, to parents, to children, and um, they are being welcomed with open arms and they are re-abusing, re uh, what's the word I want to use? Well, they're re-victimizing. Uh, they're they're creating again. creating new victims. And and that's not just hearsay. Oh, I consult can, with churches all the time where oh, that's yeah. the case. It happens. I can tell you firsthand. And again and again and again and again. So we're not protecting our children by by keeping this a secret from parents. No, and one of the really common things that they do too, the registered sex offenders, um, they'll come into churches and some of them. Uh, will behave themselves while they're on church property to an extent. But what they're doing is they're scouting out children. And because, because they have the upper hand anyway, none of the parents know that they're a sex offender because the leaders have chosen to intentionally withhold that information from the parents. So what the sex offenders do is they'll befriend parents who have these little children. And then once, once the bell rings and church is dismissed, Mm -hmm. Out in the parking lot they go and they, they they have friendships outside of church that the church leaders have no idea that they have these friendships. Right. How There's can, no way that they how can How can know. the leaders track that person? They can't. As it's they impossible. Can. So, so friendships are formed. So friendships right. are formed right. in the church. Mm-hmm. And then these guys are going into, into the homes or inviting the, the parents with the kids into their own homes. And they're sexually assaulting the kids in their homes. And again, I know because I consult with churches where daily, this daily, is the case. Jimmy is consulting with churches. I know this happens. I know happening. for a fact right. this happens. Right. So, you know, I, uh, I, it's just frustrating. If we sound frustrated, it's because we are. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's hard to imagine. Like if I, um, I, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Um, we want to keep our children safe. We want to keep them uh, innocent and pure. We want to protect them. That's our job as church leaders, as parents, as a church family. But when we know there's a known danger within that group 
and we do not warn, at least tell parents of the known danger, we're really opening the door up for tragedy. Well, again, and these aren't hypothetical dangers. No, these no, are people. These about, are people who yeah. are serial felony child rapists. Right. They they've proved time and time and time again, right. victim after victim after victim, that they can't control themselves when they're around children. And they've proven that. They've proven We've it. We've not proven no, that. They've proven by that. By their actions, you and I have talked uh, in previous podcasts that for a um, violator to get to the point of prison, there has to be evidence upon evidence mm-hmm. upon evidence. So it's not just based on hearsay or a judge's sentimentality or a judge's whim. When that book is slammed at them, mm-hmm. that's because there's hardcore evidence that they have transgressed, violently transgressed against a child criminally transgressed against the Mm -hmm. child. So, you know, we're talking, like I said previously, the real deal here. We're not talking hearsay. We're talking these actions have harmed children. Yes. So, um, well, one of the things that I wanted to bring up too is um, you have these, uh, I I hear this probably more often than not. So um, when the church leaders are, um, they're confronted by parents who find out um, they, they find out that there's a sex offender in the church. They go to the leaders. Were you aware? Well, so far, 100% of the time that I'm aware of, the church leaders know. So you have these agreements between the church leaders and the offenders. But again, the congregation doesn't know that, that there even is such an agreement. And so the church leaders will say, well, we're keeping an eye on them. Well, what you don't realize or what they don't realize is that most of the abuse um, happens right in front of other adults intentionally. So these abusers are using very sophisticated techniques. And you guys know this. I mean, I harp on this all the time. I do research in this field. They're abusing the kids right in front of your eyes and keeping you blind to that abuse. So here's my question as a church leader myself right here's my question if i know that there's a serial felony child rapist in my church why would i not want to enlist the help of other people absolutely. to help me keep an eye on this person absolutely. why yeah. would i want to yeah. bear the sole responsibility and keep that intentionally blind to the rest of the church i would be tapping the shoulders of every parent in the church and say hey here's this guy you know, we're not, we're not about witch hunts here or whatever, but we want you to be informed so that your kids stand a fighting chance to be protected against this now, guy. Why should he choose to, to get sideways right. and want to molest more victims? We're enlisting your help why to help us keep it, an eye on them. Jimmy, that, and you being a church leader, why is it, do you, think or believe or know that church leaders choose to keep this because i see email correspondence and i've spoken directly with church leaders who flat out told me why do they do it why do they do it because they again bad theology leads to bad practices they they refer to these people not as wolves uh, but as brothers or sisters Uh, very rarely is it a female offender but it happens sometimes yeah um but in most of my cases, it, you know, it's in most of all cases, it's male offenders. And so they refer to them as brothers and they say, well, you know, this has been really difficult on uh, brother so-and-so. And they're, they're talking about the offender, the rapist. Right. This has been really hard on him. And, um, you know, after all, we're all sinners and it's just so difficult for people to to confess their sins publicly. And I'm like, I'm not asking for a confession. Right. We know what the guy did. He doesn't need to confess his sins. What I'm talking about is raising awareness and letting people know. If if you have a homicidal maniac that is a serial killer, a serial felony murderer, and that guy comes into your church and he's, he's sitting in the back pew just quote-unquote minding his own business, my question is, do I have a responsibility to inform other congregants that this guy is a felony serial murderer? 
right? Like Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, and, and I can... I'm not talking about getting them to confess their sins. Right. I don't care about that. Whatever. Right. they We know right. what their sins are. I'm talking about informing people so that the parents stand a fighting chance and they know what they're up against. When and this I, guy's I, inviting their kids into their home, do, do they know that the guy's a serial felony child rapist? And, and Jimmy, I'm going to go way back to one of the first podcasts you and I did together. And we, we d- talked about this thing about forgiveness and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, h- how churches have, you know, pounded in us that we have to forgive. We remember the sins, you know, it, no more. We don't gossip about people. We love them. Uh, we extend grace. And I think that's a big, big part of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, secrecy or quiet. You can call it what you want. I call it secrecy. Um, hiding the facts from people, but it's so pound, been so pounded into us that, um, if I confess my sin or if I've served my time in jail, Mm -hmm. either or that that sin doesn't exist Mm -hmm. anymore. It's wiped clean. However, in this, um, particular what we're talking about, the, the abuser, the pedophile, the child rapist, we don't have anything really documented to say that they are remediated. Now, people are going to probably raise up an arm, some people other than survivors of abuse who know this is mm-hmm. true. But we don't have documentation saying, okay, he served two years in prison. He comes out. He will not offend again. That's well, in nothing. fact, all, all the best researchers in the field say uh, over and over and over again, be certain that you never speak in terms of um, uh, oh, curing uh, sex right. offenders because there is no such there thing. There is no such thing. So what we have is a potential hazard entering the church now with innocent children, innocent parents, and we have leaders who are choosing to solemnly keep this quiet, make a little pact between the the abuser and themselves saying, I'm going to watch you. We're going to keep an eye on you. Is that in agreement with you? And that's what's done. It's not enough. You no, have, a, you know, I said, it, I, it's a hazard. Yeah. You know, a, I, a, I said too, like, you know, there's no difference between what the Catholic church did that we know they did and what people in the Protestant churches are doing. But I, I would argue that that's not true. I would argue that what we're doing is much different than what the Catholics did, and it's much worse than what the right. Catholics did. Now, because again, there you have people who you have kids who who uh, who came forward and said, "Father and so and so is is abusing me." There was never any conviction; it wasn't right. it wasn't ever reported. Here we have people who were reported, where we found substantial evidence enough to put these guys away in prison. Right. We know that they're sex offenders, and we're still not telling our churches about them. And right. we're passing them from church to church. And I know from, from again, consulting with churches and uh, just talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, that what happens, the standard protocol for what happens when these guys do produce more victims, and they will produce more victims um, from the church. Absolutely. What happens is they'll say things like, well... You know, brother so and so got to a point where he he just kind of spiraled, and we had to ask him to leave the church, and so uh, we don't know where he ended up going to church, but then come to find out years later that he settled on a church across the street and produced more victims there. And I've heard it out of the mouths of church leaders where they're talking about it. As if it's just like, yeah, you know, and, and but if we were to do it again, we would do it all over again because of grace and mercy and all this stuff. Jimmy and, like, and this is insanity. are trying to share and, and maybe we're hopefully we're getting through to a good portion of you. When this abuse goes on, it is life altering mm-hmm. for, for the child that has been abused. Life altering. That child has gone through a trauma that takes years and years and years 
to work through, and often it's a lifetime. We're talking about something that affects a child's faith, their belief in God, their trust in people, uh, their whole, uh, ev- whole of everything. So when we allow this uh, secret to remain, we are also opening up every child that's within that community to possibly, possibly be harmed for the rest of their lives, Mm -hmm. maybe even through eternity. I'll carry it that far because it's very hard to place your trust in God, in church leaders, in uh, others when that trust has been betrayed to this degree. Mm -hmm. It truly is. And some people can say, oh, you're really exaggerating. No, ask our survivors of abuse. They'll speak out. They'll let us know. Well, turn on the TV today and listen Listen. to survivors from the Catholic Church. Listen to the brokenness. Listen, if we can help prevent that, then by all means, we have to do everything in our power to help prevent that kind of tragedy from continuing. And all we're saying is, I mean, bottom line, um, parents have the right to know when there's a serial felony child rapist in the church. Um, Every single parent of every single child has a right to know. Amen. It's not that complicated. I don't think it's that complicated. No, Um, it's not. And we're not asking that they bring out pitchforks and... You know, we're not saying any of that. We're just saying inform. That's it. Truly. Inform people. Truly. If this person entering the church was responsible Mm -hmm. and, and really where they should be. They'd be the ones, they'd be the ones informing the parents. They would be the ones insisting, I need to stand Mm -hmm. up and let everybody know where I've been, what I've been about, and that I need help keeping me on the street. Absolutely. Now. Sure. So that's a thought we want, we yeah. really want to leave parents with. And we're not trying to beat anybody up or, or judge, condemn or whatever. This is to bring awareness as to what, uh, you know, what's going on and what our responsibilities are as parents and yeah. as church leaders. Yeah. Okay, what do you think, so, Jimbo? We- yeah, next next week we'll um, kind of get to the, okay, what, what do we do about this? Right, and that's you know, going to be a powerful, what's the solution to power, this? powerful um, podcast because we'll have answers to some of this. Yeah. We'll have steps that we can take. So we'll, we'll kind of burst, burst that bubble a little bit with our truth bomb because uh, I think people, parents need to get started on this like today or yesterday. So our truth bomb is that parents need to practice these two things. One is um, to investigate. What I mean by that is that when you find out that there's a registered sex offender in your church, look at the public records that are available to you at your fingertips um, and find out what they actually did. They're not secret. That's it. Yeah. We have every means to look up this this information. Find out are they a tier one, two, one, two, three offender are they a sexually violent predator? Um, how many charges were pled away uh, or waived as part of the plea deal? Find that out. That's you, public. You have that information. That, that's it's public. free. Right. It's, it's at your fingertips. Right. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to share. Share those results with other parents. And if if the leaders so choose to not inform the church, that's their prerogative. Right. That's on them. Uh, Quite frankly, my opinion is I don't want to be standing next to them on Judgment Day. Um, That's just how I I feel. That's my strong opinion. Uh, People can disagree with me. That's fine. But as a parent, um, if the church leaders so choose to not inform other parents in the church, that's their baby. That's on them. You, however, have a responsibility or a burden from one parent to the next parent to protect not only your children, but to protect the children of other people's parents. When you know that there's a serial felony child rapist in your church. So you are free to share that information. Um, That's not gossip. No, That's not trashing somebody. It's public information. And it's protecting your child children. 
So you are free to do that, and I encourage you to do that. And uh, whether you have the support of other people or not, um, let that be a personal decision. I, I'm saying as a parent myself, um, man, I would just, I would have no problem informing every other parent in whatever congregation I'm in. Um, and just to tell, Absolutely. just to let them know, hey, right. were you aware that this guy has this as a record and you're just alerting you're, you're putting the red alert <laughs> sign up beware keep your kids safe yes so thank you all for tuning in and next week we'll talk about solutions um, how do we respond to this as a group how do we network how do we build a stronger safer community thank you for listening and we'll catch you next episode thanks again for listening to today's episode of the speaking out on sex abuse podcast If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.